How are you? Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you. I guess you are sitting in your very huge library. Not, Thank not you, very Dr. huge. Uh, Gamba <laughs> can be deceptive, but it is real <laughs> books, not, not virtual. <laughs> okay. And the second speaker we have with us is Professor Dato Dr. Rashila Ramli, who is the president of Malaysian Social Science Association and as well from ICMAS UKM. Welcome, Professor Dato. Yeah, Assalamualaikum. Welcome. Thank you so much. And be happy to be here. Alhamdulillah. Okay, good. All right. And, and the third panelist with us uh, uh, today is Saudari Nur Rahma Osman, who is a program officer at All Party Parliamentary Group Malaysia. Welcome, Saudari. Thank you so you? much, Ms. Azlan. I'm good. Thank you. I guess you are live from San Francisco, I guess. <laughs> I wish. San Francisco, yeah. We wish. <laughs> All right, we're going to have a session, uh, two presentations. We're going through a uh, discussion on two presentations. We're going to look, the title that we chose for this session was Localizing SDG in Malaysia, in Malaysia the Challenges and the Hopes. And we can see uh, many parties are talking about SDG from different perspectives, from different uh, depth. And this session is for us to understand from the academia and from the civil society how actually we are going to implement SDG or make it as a framework that we want to achieve the goals that being stated. So I would like to invite Saudari Nur Rahma Othman for the, for, to present the first uh, session. Welcome. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Azlan Shah. It's a bit last minute changes because uh, Datuk Danisa was supposed to be uh, the speaker, one of the speakers today. But I think he'll be with us uh, during the Q&A session after this. But anyways, uh, let me just share my screen. So what I'm do today is basically to just uh, echo what uh, YB Datuk Rohani mentioned earlier in PGM SDG. So I'll, uh, just one second. Yep. So um, uh, I'll further explain in terms of the APPGM SDG formation and setup um, a little bit on secretariat team, pilot phase that involved in 2020, uh, the timeline of the projects, uh, a bit on research and solutions, um, on key lessons and um, I'll try to conclude my session afterwards. So let's start with the formation and setup of APPGM SDG. So APPGM SDG stands for All Party Parliamentary Group Malaysia on Sustainable Development Goals, or in Bahasa Malaysia is Kumpulan Rentas Party Parliament Malaysia mengenai matlamat pembangunan lestari. But we would rather uh, we would rather call it as APPGM SDG. Uh, easier in that sense. Um, this group uh, has been approved by Parliament of Malaysia on 17 October to, uh, 2019 and uh, it has been formally registered with Secretary of Parliament with the membership uh, from both Dewan Negara and Dewan Rakyat. Um, the Secretariat is actually the Malaysian CSOSDG Alliance, which is headed by our beloved uh, Professor Dr. Dr. Dani Sanjaya Surya. Um, our mandate is actually to undertake localizing SDGs at the parliamentary constituency level, as well as preparing policy research and strategic papers in that sense. So if you can see from my screen right now, um, we are indeed a bipartisan group where the committee members comprises of the chairman. Our chairman is a YB, Datuk Suri Haja Rohani Abdul Karim from GPS PPB, which is the MP of Batang Lupa, Sabah, uh, Sarawak, sorry. The deputy chairman is YB Puan Mara Chin Abdullah from PKR, MP of Petaling Jaya. Secretary is uh, YB Tuan William Leong Ji Tin from PKR, um, MP of Selayang. Our treasurer uh, is YB Dr. Kelvin Yi Li Wen from the AP, Bandar Kuching, um, and other APPG SDG member from Dewan Rakyat, which is uh, YB Tuan Wong Tat from the AP, Member of Parliament of Bentong, YB Tuan Ahmad Hassan from Warisan, MP of Papa, and from the Dewan Negara, we have two senators, YB Senator Adrian Bani Lasimbang from Sabah, um, YB Senator Datuk Paul Iga from Sarawak. So 
we are very bi bipartisan in that sense. Let's move forward to the secret secretariat. So the secretariat team comprises of um, head of secretariat that I just mentioned earlier, Professor Dr. Dr. Dennis Jaya Surya, head of finance, Ms. Lavanya Ramadia, head of research, Mr. Aliza Mahadi, and Professor Dr. Zainal Abidin Sanusi, which was the earlier speaker. Um, for the head of solution, we have uh, Dr. Lin Mui Kiang, Treasurer, Mr. Kon Onsen, Program Officer, myself, Ms. Nora Mautman, and the Finance Officer, Mr. Anthony Tan Ki Huat. And we have uh, other seven lead coordinators that oversee and um, monitor the progress of the project for each location. Like Professor Dr. 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 Rashida Ramli, she's uh, taking care of uh, parliament, uh, two parliaments in Sabah uh, for Papar and Pensiangan. All right, this is the pilot phase in 2020. We have basically uh, visited um, 10 constituencies in seven states throughout Malaysia. We have in Kedah, Kelantan, Selangor, Pahang, Johor, Sabah, and Sarawak. We have two um, respectively for Sabah and Sarawak. So that uh, makes it four constituencies in both uh, states. Um, we have Pendang, Jeli, Selayang, Petaling Jaya, Bentong, Tanjung Pia, and Papar, um, and uh, Sabah and Sarawak. So that's basically the name of the member of parliament that involved uh, in this pilot phase project. So in regards to our timeline, um, we have four phases altogether, and uh, we are expecting to be finished by March 2021 next year. Um, initially, our timeline was at, uh, was from January 2020 to um, December 2020, but then due to COVID and all, we there are some delays on our side. So we have already um, applied to MOF and the Parliament to actually extend our project grant to uh, March next year. So if you can see four phases over there, phase one is the mapping and awareness or raising or identification of issues and stakeholders, which has happened during January to March this year. Phase two, project and program design or uh, solution focus happened in April uh, to June. And phase three, which is right now happening, project or program execution. Uh, this is expected to be finished by January or February next year. And phase four is mainly on the project review and drawing conclusion from February to March 2021. All right, um, I'm not gonna go in a very detailed manner for research, but basically the methodology that we use is actually on situational analysis. If you can see, we have uh, about six steps altogether for our research method. And yeah, this is the um, initial themes of the local issues that our teams have uh, mapped out earlier during our phase one of the field visit. Uh, and it's worth noting that no two places are the same and the issues are very highly context contextual. So you can see uh, over there, we have already uh, mapped out for each constituency accordingly to the SDG. Uh, okay, from the issue mapping activities that we have done before this, we can say that the issues across or uh, in most of the con constituencies are actually quite common to each other and they are cross-cutting in social, economy and environment. So this is the overview of major themes and characteristics. If you can see over there, for Bentong, we have the major themes on sustainable agriculture, Selayang on migrant issue, Petaling Jaya on urban poverty, Tajung Pia on sustainable tourism, Papar on uh, development impact on agriculture, Pensiangan, um, youth and women's empowerment, Kuching, squatters, squatters issue, Batang Sadong connectivity and accessibility, Pendang agriculture and land ownership, and for Jelly, um, it's in regards to the smallholder schemes and decent work. And you can see the characteristic over there, like for Bentong is a uh, semi-urban, 
for PJ is the urban, semi-rural, for the other places. Yeah. Um, all right. So from that activity as well, uh, we have already mapped out which group uh, is actually left behind. So for Bentong, uh, we found out that the farmers and orang asli, Playa migrants and orang asli, Petaling Jaya, uh, the B40 groups, low cost housing, PPRs, resident, Tanjung Piai, um, the B40 groups, fishermen and youth, Papa, Paddy Farmer, fishermen, Pensangan youth and women, like the one that we, we have mapped out earlier on the local issues. Batang Sadong, youth and farmers, Pendang farmers, rubber tapers, jelly, B40, smallholders, women, youth, and orang asli. So from those um, local issues and the target groups that we have identified, the project teams have um, come up or designed a solution project and capacity building accordingly to the needs and the local issues themselves. So, so far we have um, identified and get them approved. We have around 22 capacity building and 32 solution projects, which uh, most of them have uh, already underway for now. All right. Um, I'm going to touch a little bit on the key lessons that we have, that we have got from our work through that. So the first one is the, on the multi-stakeholder partnership. Um, all right. Okay, so from our work, I can say that um, as we are working very closely with the MPs, so they have eventually become the SDG champions in their respective constituency. And uh, also we have created smart partnership with local champions and interagency cooperation a multi-dimensional approach for intervention is actually a very um, key point in uh, localizing SDG. Also, I would like to highlight that SDG 17 is very, very crucial. I think without WIF, uh, we will not be able to achieve other goals as to start off with. The second key lesson All right, okay. The second key lesson is actually on the district level staff as key to localizing SDGs. During our um, phase one, phase two, and as well phase three, uh, I think we had a very good interaction with uh, district level staff and local authority. And they are very well versed with their individual agency or department mandates, but not really on the cross cutting issues. This is when the PGM SDG um, comes in play where we provide for capacity building programs to engage the civil servants um, at the grassroots level just so they could understand the concept of SDG um, in more better. Lah. Because if um, the, the, the district level staff don't come together to really understand the concept, I don't think that it would be possible for them to actually carry out uh, the localization of SDG. And the next one is, um, the APPGM SCG team and partners from public and private higher education institutions could actually play a role um, in this uh, regards too, as we are developing SDG toolkit for the ground level officers. And for this purpose, I think funds and resources um, can be made available with an action plan to reach out to other districts uh, across country in localizing SDG. The next one is uh, in regards to federal state relations. Um, one of the main concerns is actually, um, especially when the MPs or adults are from different sites, or when the state government and federal government are different, it would be like, you know, they, they work in such a way that uh, in a very silo, um, uh, in, a, in a very silo, uh, composition, uh, like they would mind just for their business, not the other party's business, you know what I mean? So 
I think um, this is when APPG and MSDG comes in play. Um, we, we use SDG in a um, politically neutral way to address the local concerns. We, we don't want the differences in politics which actually hinder a very good cause for the people. And uh, also in this sense, an uh, SDG panel of experts and professionals who are politically neutral can actually find a balance and solution on this. Yeah, okay, for the conclusion, um, APPGM SDG illustrates a bipartisan action in localizing SDG. The field visits and local consultation illustrates that local people know the issues and what solutions need to take place. It's a decentralized approach. Multi-stakeholder engagement at the grassroots is key. Um, more capacity building is needed for civil servants at the grassroots of frontline staff at district and local government levels. And the, the important impact in working with local partners in identifying and determining local priorities in a way that uh, we shall adopt a bottom-up approach and allocate the funds uh, accordingly to the decision made by the locals as to their needs and the issues that they are facing uh, will eventually enable the acceleration of localizing SDG. And uh, one last thing is uh, I would like to highlight that SDG 17 on partnership is very, very important in making sure that the localization of SDG can be done throughout the country. I think that's all from me, Chazlan. Thank you. Thank you, Sadari uh, Nur Rahma. That is a very detailed, I guess, uh, explanation about the Secretariat. Uh, Professor Dato, uh, Dr. Rashila, I, I think you would be giving us the more uh, specific role of academia and especially uh, from what uh, Sadari Nur Rahma said about partnership on how to uh, to actualize uh, SDG partnership in, on, on the ground to, to achieve the goals. Uh, yeah, I would like to invite uh, Professor Dato to present. Uh, welcome. I, I need to unmute your audio. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jazlan. Um, and uh, yes, uh, for my task to, for this, this, uh, in this session, I will actually be going into the nitty gritty of uh, localizing SDGs uh, and uh, looking specifically on the capacity building and solutions. And I'm us using the case of uh, I'm using the case of Sabah uh, because in this case, this is where I am uh, in charge as lead coordinator. So that makes it easier to to relate to a lot of things which has been happening on the ground. Yeah. So thank you to the organizer for having me here for the program. So we move on. All right, with the next slide. So what does localization really mean? Okay, we keep saying localizing, 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 but what does it really mean? Uh, so we have a working definition here, which we will, I think, uh, solidify it further by the end of the year as we go along, yeah? But, uh, at, at this point, the, the working definition that I'm using is this, the process of adapting the content of, of SDGs to a specific locality. Okay, so specific locality. So the geographical part comes into play by taking into consideration the needs of the people most affected, no one to be left behind, by a certain issue. We also need to take into consideration the cultural norms of the communities uh, in, in place and definitely stakeholders' commitment. So these are three important components that we need to look into when we, uh, when we work, as, uh, work into localizing uh, SDGs. And uh, we move on. How does localization take place, at least for APPGM? Localization can take place differently for different organizations. Yeah? If it is for a company, it's different. If it is for the university, it could be different. But for APPGM specifically, based on the four phases that Rahma uh, mentioned in her presentation, we have to do it in all the phases. 
and it starts with the issue mapping where you need to prioritize the issues and the specific SDGs associated with the issues because there may be two or three overlapping SDGs. Before we can go into the capacity building or even the solution, we need to then identify who are the stakeholders involved yeah, and the partners uh, who can actually carry out the, 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 the capacity building as well as the solution project. So this is where it is important to make sure that uh, we have very capable partners, trustable, capable, and can deliver uh, the work that we want. At the same time, we're looking also into, for example, NGOs, uh, local NGOs. Uh, it is part also uh, for capacity building purposes. Yeah, So it is trying to find a good match in order to carry out the project. So this th that, that takes place in part of phase two into yeah, that part of phase two. Then you go into capacity building for the community and then into the solution. Now in the solution project, there are different components and this is where we work closely with the local universities. Okay, so there is the part, sorry, spelling, project design, project implementation, evaluation, and then the, long, the longevity of it, which is the sustainability. So you need to look into all these components as you plan uh, the, 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 the overall uh, localizing uh, of SDGs within APPGM. Okay, we move on. So now, okay, if you look at um, the issue mapping, the three general big criteria or, or, or categories are actually the social dimension, the economic dimension, and the environment. And this is very much so, especially in, in Sabah, the state that I work uh, with uh, for APPGM. Yeah? So social, economy, as well as the environment. And with that, when we look at the stakeholders for partnership, uh, later on, I'll run through the different uh, projects. Um, we are actually working with uh, two of the parliamentary area, at least for Sabah, for, for at least the, the first cohort, uh, Papar and Pensiangan. Mm -hmm. And then you have the district, you have the local authority. And uh, we work in Sabah, at least we work with one public university and one private university. Uh, in Sabah, we work with the University uh, Malaysia Sabah and then also with the University College of Sabah Foundation. So we do have uh, uh, different universities that we work with. Yeah? And that then you also need to identify the partners. Overall, within APPGM projects at this point, there are 31 partners in the 10 uh, locations, the 10 uh, constituencies. Okay? Uh, but for Sabah, it will be about two or three in each of the uh, parliamentary area. So multi-stakeholders uh, partnership is very important uh, and I'll elaborate a little further uh, later, okay, towards the conclusion. So we move on. So capacity building, once we do the mapping and we identify uh, the issues, then we can also look into what possible capacity building which are needed for the area. Uh, and this comes from the ground, from, from, from the participants. Yeah? So capacity building sessions are being carried out for government agencies from federal, state, and local levels, NGOs, community leaders, and community on the SDG principle and how they are relevant to them in their work and daily life. Sometimes what happens is they are already working on SDGs without really knowing that they are working on SDGs. So it's a matter of highlighting a few things and they say, oh yeah, actually we're already doing this. So, you know, uh, it's a matter of um, clarifying certain issues or pinpointing uh, the work that they're doing, which is already relevant to SDG. So it's a matter of creating that awareness, yeah? So these uh, sessions, they range from sessions for government agencies or communities or joint session for them to increase understanding. So we don't have just for the government, but we have government together with NGOs. Then they are, we're building that bridge where they can actually 
speak to one another. And that is very important because sometimes, as mentioned by Rahma earlier too, uh, organizations, communities, sometimes they tend, and especially government agencies, they tend to work in silo. So even between government agencies, we need to make sure uh, we, we try to, to, to put them together in a space where they can actually have a conversation. And that is, that is really important. Yeah? And uh, the sessions do resolve, uh, to resolve issues on specific subject matters. Okay, we can move on. Uh, for solution projects, now, these projects are designed to address the issues and challenges identified during the field visits and discussion with the MP's office, government agencies, NGOs, community leaders, and community. And they are, they are wide ranging and they cover many sectors. Now, what I have done on the other slide is actually to, uh, now, I, yeah, what, what I've done is to classify into eight different groupings. So all the projects listed, we've got other slides in terms of the individual projects, but actually in reality, they are, uh, they can be classified under eight, eight categories. Yeah, education, waste management, uh, skills training, women empowerment, entrepreneurial development, economy, uh, economic well-being, uh, community development, and health. So different projects would fall under, happens to fall under these categories. It's not that we create the category first, but instead we see what are the, what are the issues involved, and then we group them together after. So it is really a bot pretty much a bottom-up approach instead of a a top-down approach, yeah? So, in the case of Sabah, okay, excuse me. In the case of Sabah, for Papar and Pesiangan, as you can see, uh, we actually partnered very strongly, uh, definitely through the uh, YB's office, YB Haji Ahmad and YB Arthur in Pesiangan, uh, Arthur Joseph Kurup. And then those are the universities involved, two separate universities. One happened to be private, one happened to be public university. And uh, we did the first few visit in February, just before MCO. So we just managed, just, just right there. Uh, and this was uh, um, third week of February, yeah? February 21st until 24th uh, for Papar. And we followed through with Persiangan. We then followed with different online meetings, February, July, and actually the last one we had was uh, just a week ago on the 26th of October. So we constantly engage with, uh, with the partners uh, for capacity building and uh, for solution projects on, online. Now, we did manage to do one uh, a second site visit where capacity building programs were conducted both in Papar and Persiangan, and that was on the 2nd to the 4th of uh, September for Papar, and then 4th to the 6th uh, of September for uh, Persiangan. Actually, it was really in the daerah Keningau. Eh? Uh, yep. All those the projects actually run all the way into Nabawan, Suk, and Pekalongan. So these are really areas close to the border uh, uh, in the Kalimantan area. Okay. So we move on. So let me run through a couple how we prioritize. Now, if you, when we, as I say, uh, during the field visit, we visited the different areas. This was, some of those were arranged by, uh, most of those were actually arranged by the uh, office of, of, of YBs. However, there were our, our network with the, uh, CSOs in the different areas also take us to different other areas which might we may not have seen if it is just only arranged through the YB's office. Regardless, uh, there were five issues which were which were prioritized uh, at the end of the uh, at the visit after the three day visit, and then even that that was further prioritized in terms of what is feasible in terms of execution because of the time frame, because of the uh, allocation, 
as well as because of the need for uh, partners who can who can actually uh, deliver within the short the, the time frame that we have. So in the end, two of the projects for Papar, uh, agriculture and the Pan Borneo issue that came up very strongly. So the partners were actually the, bed, the Paddy Planters Group uh, together with UMS. Yeah, and uh, we have another project there, which is uh, the hatchery project because there was lacks of lack of catchment for the fishermen there in uh, Kampung Kuala. So the the fishermen as well as the youth group there are involved in this hatchery project and this is through the fishermen's organization as well as uh, in partnership with uh, UMS actually in these two areas the university did need to uh, does need to take a, a slightly a predominant role uh, in in the work that is being done so so this is how we work together with the CSOs and then with the uh, government agencies here yeah? we move on Maybe another seven minutes or so. All right. Prioritization of issues for persiangan. We went through the same same uh, system, same model. Yeah. So there are a lot more issues in persiangan because of the fact that the area is wider. You may have less population, but because it is such a wide area, uh, I mean, you have to cross rivers, you have to take ferries, and you know, you have to do all those things. And in these areas, there are eight issues which were brought up again and again for our consideration. Yeah, uh, so poverty, issue of clean water and sanitation, employment for the youth, again agriculture, especially land ownership, irrigation, health and well-being, uh, education. Education here is really because of the distance. Yeah, we have lots of dropout uh, after after primary school. They are not able to go to the secondary school uh, most of the time because of the distance as well as of course finance and then number eight is a uh, waste management so in the end after going through uh, the process we actually uh, zoom in on two selected two projects uh, can we go quickly this way yeah the two projects are the employment for the youth uh, this is under SDG 8 and uh, we have the group working on that uh, as well, I mean, this is for capacity building, if I'm not mistaken. But for the so solution phase, we work on health and well-being. This is through uh, the group on SAWO, as well as uh, we also have the waste management. Yeah, I need to rework this a bit. Uh, by another group uh, that has to, uh, yeah, by another group uh, under the commentary and belia as well, uh, part of the partners. Okay, so with that stakeholder meetings again so this is a combination it's not just government but we have also the ngos we have the academician here so there is always this three-way at least a three-way um, conversation going on in getting the project going because the the idea here is that in order to to increase the success of the projects and also to uh, increase the awareness of SDG. The thing is this, um, there is a need to ensure that people feel the ownership of the project. Yeah, They need to feel that they own the project. It's not something that is given to them or something that is being top down. Yeah, if Then it is much easier to get things done, much easier to move things uh, on the ground. So this is what happened here. So with stakeholder engagement. So I've just got a couple more. Okay, uh, yeah, those were the solution. For capacity building, we actually did uh, SDG awareness and mainstreaming workshop for governments, uh, as, uh, CSOs, and non-profit organizations. This was for the SDG awareness and, main, and, and mainstream actually was done in many places. Yeah, Bentong, Tanjung Pia, Selayang, uh, Selayang, Papar, Pesiangan, Batang Sadung, and Kuching. Uh, and we have completed that for papar and persiangan and what we did actually was to ask them to do a, what they what we call a community action plan where uh, these are for government uh, civil servants so we we will be following up with them to see what they have accomplished in the short period that uh, they have uh, since they took the, the the program in september 
so this is something that uh, we are very uh, happy to follow through later on. The other two projects in Papar and uh, Persiangan are actually a public forum on the Papar Dam. This is a big issue because of the fact that it impacts the especially paddy planters and those living by the river. Yeah, and uh, it's about sustainable water management. Then there is the awareness of women and child rights legislation and health in Persiangan. So that will be taking place in three places. In the last conversation I had with the head of the project from Sao, uh, Madam Winnie, uh, they are going to, they've had the capacity building. So they are following through in three of the villages. So that will take place if things goes well, as you know, because of the CMCO and so on. We hope that we can start in, set in uh, the first week of uh, December. Uh, so that's the, that's the, the basic program uh, which are going on right now. Okay, I think the uh, second last slide, good. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, solution, as I have mentioned, we have done all this, Persiangan, three projects, yeah, wellness, waste management, and women empowerment. In Papa, we have the agro project and then the Siakap uh, farming, yeah, and the hatchery project. So as you can see, we also relate to all the SDGs inside there. So these are the SDGs they're trying to accomplish in the, in the different projects. Move on. Okay, as you can see, in the project execution, we have the design, the planning, the implement and the assessment. So we are only up to level three in, in 20 of the projects across APPGM. Uh, in Sabah, uh, out of the five projects, I think we have done, we, we, have, we have started on four, but we have one more which have not started. And uh, yeah, the assessment will follow. Now under the assessment monitoring and evaluation, this is where we will have another group of academia that will come, uh, that will form a team uh, to go in so that you have a separate group from those who have done the research and those who are working on the projects. Yeah. So this gives us another pool of, um, of people who will have the capacity to do monitoring and evaluation. Uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, they, they, we will look uh, from the, diff the, the already six different universities right there. We also have the Malaysian uh, SDG Academic Network. Uh, plus other associations, including the Malaysian Social Science Association, who, who, uh, whose members are mostly academicians that can actually be part of the monitoring and evaluation group later. Okay. And lastly, yeah. Uh, in conclusion, yeah, localizing SDG is a bottom-up approach to identify local issues with local partners. Uh, some projects may need more scaffolding compared to others, so more assistance, yeah. And then just to add a, 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 a one more thing, some challenges that we do, do face, connect at least for Sabah, the issue of connectivity because of the distance and the lack of uh, not enough um, uh, telecommunication services, uh, the, the vast uh, track location. And um, lastly here, as I said, as a conclusion, sustainability can only be achieved through people's empowerment and the sense of ownership towards the project. So this is what we try to instill and we work together closely with those at the grassroots. So thank you very much. Uh, so that's my presentation. Thanks. Thank you so much, Professor Dato Dr. Rashila. That is a very thorough and a well-planned uh, uh, document just now we just saw and how it's being implemented on the ground in yeah. Sabah. Uh, I think I want to start with uh, Dato, uh, Dr. Dennison, uh, maybe through what we saw just now from what been shared by Puan, uh, sorry, uh, Sadari Nur Rahman and, uh, and also Professor Dato, Dr. Ashila, what actually is the real uh, challenges when you had this secretariat to propagate, to call to the awareness of SDG what are the concerns and what are the challenges that normally faced when you engage with the people uh, on the ground? Dr. Danison. Yeah, um, I, I think um, I think the uh, to uh, to start off the SDGs itself was agreed by the governments around the world 
in okay. September 2015. And Malaysia did the uh, voluntary national review report in 2016. Uh, and the development plans then already incorporated in the 11th Malaysia plan references to SDG. But the problem was localizing in the way uh, which was highlighted today and now illustrated very well by Prof. Rashila in terms at the state level going down into the parliamentary uh, district and then into the kampong level. I think the biggest challenge is how to bring a global agenda that is a focus of the national development agenda and then it becomes the priority at the grassroots because we are top down planning you know putra jaya parliament planning and then going down but sdgs is more a bottom up process where the local people say what are local priorities whether it could be poverty it could be agriculture it could be waste management it could be forest uh, it could be other local issues, education. I think Prof. Rashila had eight categories um, that was highlighted. And earlier, uh, Rama had uh, the different um, target groups and issues identified. I think it is finding the synergy between ground, uh, ground reality with the top-down planning. And I think what the APPG has done with members of parliament, uh, support of parliament, and then going to the ground, uh, calling uh, district level government agencies together to discuss. So we are not uh, out of the development plans, but each local context has different priorities uh, or areas that would differ from other locations and getting people to participate. So I think one of our challenges in this context is none of this material is translated into Bahasa Malaysia. So the documents are not there. So I think uh, Rama and other people try to put it into Bahasa because now you're going to a kampong you're going to a Felder scheme. You're going to an Orang Asli area to talk about economic, social, environmental, the cross-cutting nature, empowerment of women and children, looking at education, not just handouts, you know, not just bantuan and kebajikan, uh, but more of uh, ground development. So that was, I think, one of our first uh, challenges in taking. I think getting the support of parliamentarians was not an issue. Uh, we had uh, the support of the cross-party people because we have representatives from PAS, MCA, DAP, uh, PKR, Barisan, the Sarawak party that uh, Dato uh, Nancy Shukri is in. Uh, Dato Mustafa Muhammad in Bursatu. So we got a very strong uh, government, former government, uh, and so forth. So it's in taking. Uh, it's an ongoing process. I think COVID is the other major ch challenge. Prof. Rashila showed um, that uh, YB Maria highlighted, YB Kelvin highlighted uh, those things. Uh, but a lot of these activities are not quick fix, you know. I think YB Kelvin talked about uh, Kampung Chawan in Kuching. So it's a massive, uh, massive concern for redevelopment uh, and housing of a whole group. They are not foreigners. They are not refugees or migrants. They are locals from the Kampongs in Sarawak that came to the city and they are living there. And likewise in other places. So housing, education, and, and so forth. Uh, so it is not a quick fix. Although budget allocation and time uh, is uh, terhad, 
but we are looking at the long haul and the 12th Malaysia plan might be the framework for us. Dr. Danison, how you see moving forward? Now we have 10 parliamentary constituencies. Yes. Uh, is the plan is to have more parliamentaries uh, involved or how actually moving forward so that the, 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 the NGOs, the institution that is interested would, would, would yeah. see uh, the end goal? Yes. Now, now we took uh, 10 uh, first in a pilot study uh, because when we needed the money, because the APPG in terms of just doing the research uh, or discussions in parliament, not much money is needed. But when you go to the ground, we need it. And MOF, uh, when we presented first in 2019, the budget took into account for 2022 million. This year in the negotiation, largely with economic planning unit, um, the statistics department, uh, and in presentation to Ministry of Finance, they agreed to our proposal to enlarge it to 20 more kawasans. So it will be 10 plus 20. So we will have 30 areas out of the 222 parliamentary constituencies. Uh, and, and so the budget of 5 million that uh, was announced uh, last week uh, will address uh, 20 new parliamentary constituencies, some money for the first 10, but the first 10 we are hoping to get a CSR, private sector, other fundings to come in and also to work with government agencies uh, because government agencies have their uh, development budget and their operational budget if they address it. Um, so we are expanding to another 20, which then means our secretariat, our team of volunteers, our partners, because like uh, Dr. Rashila just now highlighted there, we have 31 solution partners and seven research partners, six from universities uh, and one is a think tank. So we need to enlarge our partner base uh, because some of the cost is absorbed uh, by the partners or they are given small grants. Even the researchers uh, are given uh, small research grants to carry out uh, the writing and the documentation. And so the 31 partners, then it will expand. So our projects now, uh, micro projects, I think uh, with capacity building and solution is more than 50, I think on the ground. Uh, and, and so that will expand. So the organizational logistic, and we are praying COVID, we can restrict COVID to by December. If not, we, we are faced because uh, group meeting, travel, interaction, mobilizing volunteers, um, academicians, research students to participate uh, will be a major challenge as it is now where we are using Zoom, but to go into the kampong and do things, uh, we will need face-to-face um, direct contact as well. Thank you, Dr. Donison. Uh, Professor, Dr. Dr. Rashila, if we see just now, uh, Dr. Donison mentioned about uh, the dissemination of these SDG ideas and documents is restricted due to the language barrier. I mean, it's not enough uh, translation or a better way to communicate. How do you see academia can play the role of uh, accelerating this uh, dissemination so that we can uh, move things faster. Mm. Okay, uh, thank you, Azlan. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is true that uh, originally, as you know, the SDG document is pretty much in, uh, in English. Of course, it's been translated into a few of the major languages. However, when we do go down to the ground, definitely either we have to use Malay or 
even that might not be enough. For example, in the Nabawan area and so on, we need to get it translated into Murut. So depending on the location that you're in. So this is where to have a local uh, academician from the area, uh, as well as uh, the, you know, the community leaders there, then it is much easier to get uh, to, to, to speed up uh, uh, the transfer of knowledge to the different groups in, 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 the, in the more of the rural areas. Uh, so that, that would be one, definitely. Um, and then uh, another area that the, the academician can actually work in is actually to, with the data that we are gathering, there are a lot more now we can give input for the YBs uh, and then also the researchers in parliaments. And this would actually help towards writing up short policy briefs now, especially when parliament is in session or before that, they already know what kind of issues to bring up. This is where we can also uh, increase the knowledge of SDGs. Right now, you know, within the parliament, uh, for the parliamentarians as well. So th these are ways that we can work. Uh, and we have been working on that. Trust that to Denison to do that, yeah. So, so, so that's, 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 uh, that's my take on it for now, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Prof. Uh, may I see uh, Sodari Rahma? She's there still. Yes, Rama is still there. Rama. I think to be fair, I would ask a question sure, too. You should, you should. Yes. Uh, being a program officer, I think a lot of NGOs and uh, so civil societies are interested to know. Maybe uh, through your experience with uh, APBGM, uh, what would be the, I mean a new way of engaging, I mean, doing programs. Uh, just now, Dr. Donison mentioned, it's not just about handouts, one-off. So it, it needs to be a very long-term relationship. So what actually is behind the thinking of, of moving forward programs that is long-term? What should be in consideration, more so in this time of crisis? Yeah, um, I think in that sense, um, the, the partnership, between the CSOs and uh, CSO in this localization is very, very important. And everyone needs to know their role and responsibility. And um, they need to actually advocate and educate themselves on the, on the concept of SDG itself, first thing first. Because if everyone doesn't come together to understand clearly that what is actually SDG, then we will face um, a very um, challenging moment to actually localize SDG throughout the, the, the country. And in terms of the selection of uh, programs, uh, I think um, as long as the partnership is there, we can actually uh, work together to, to, you know, to brainstorm from time to time of the, uh, of the type of programs that we can actually serve uh, to the people. Um, based on the SDGs. All right, thank you. Uh, I would say this is the last question I would ask to Dato Danison. Uh, I think many NGOs and institutions uh, working on the ground right now uh, sees many potential uh, issues to be addressed as soon as possible. And those who are watching or might watch this later would want to engage with the APPGM Secretariat to understand better SDG. How would they how would they get contact or get uh, get to engage with this secretariat, Dr. Anderson? Okay, I I think uh, the bulk of the CSOs that are involved with us are all uh, associated with the Malaysian CSO SDG Alliance. The alliance is now um, informal grouping of organisations over. 50 organizations uh, that represent uh, economic, social, environmental groups uh, that have come together. It also includes uh, academic as well as think tank groups. Um, I think the best way to contact is uh, directly to through J. Rama and uh, also Anthony Tan, who are both um, uh, full-time staff. Yeah. We have a Facebook and I think uh, Rama can post 
you know, any links in the chat yeah. uh, column so that people can uh, contact us. Uh, we will be looking for new partners uh, for 2021 because we will be going to 20 different locations, which is largely parliamentary constituencies. Uh, we will give priority to states where we are not in, uh, but we will also still continue uh, to increase the numbers in Sabah, Sarawak. Uh, now we are in Klantan, but we will try and reach out to Trungano, to Pahang, uh, to Perlis, to Penang, to Perak, uh, Negri Sinbilan, where we are not in. So we will try uh, in the 20 new allocations to cover the states. I think where civil society is a little weak is we are not well distributed, you know. I think NCWO has district level, Mercy Malaysia might have, uh, Majlis Blia Malaysia has. But many of the other NGOs are actually Klang Valley based, better resource, better leadership and organizing. So we would need partners, like let's say we were looking for partners in Pendang. We were looking for partners in Jerli. So we have grassroots, Persatuan Penduduk. We have the Ketua Kampung uh, and all that. But we didn't have uh, in some areas. Huh? We are also looking for partners from social enterprises. Social enterprises uh, can be accredited with magic. They have a social objective but they run on sustainable financial resources. So we are looking for more partners and they are welcome. Uh, and But we haven't started the process for 2021, but currently the 10 kawasans that we are in, there will also be opportunities to move beyond. Um, and even uh, companies that have CSR funding uh, or they are operating in those kawasans might like to partner with us. So we are shifting in the SDGs from relief to development in more concrete ways. Um, so I, I hope uh, that this program can draw. And also for university students and lecturers, these locations could become living labs. So a lecturer that might be doing biodiversity, might also link it with people empowerment or agro-tourism, uh, organic farms. There could be other waste management. There might be engineering students or other faculties as well uh, who could then devote, uh, whether it is undergraduate work or postgraduate work, they can go regular. Uh, so I hope that is helpful, uh, and I'm sure uh, Prof. Rashila could uh, also highlight some possible partnership links. Uh, but um, we, we will make it known, but uh, I know since the budget, there are two or three people who have already called me up because they all see Sekarang ada lima juta, dulu kosong. When we were kosong, nobody wanted to join us. Uh, I remember Prof. Rashila, when she first went out to Sabah, she had to tango all the bills by herself <laughs> yeah. because the money had not come in. But yeah. that's okay. okay. We have uh, some financial backing. We have the support of government, federal government agencies. We now have the support of parliament. We have the support of EPU. We want to work closely with ICU, state governments, and especially the district office and local authority. So we call more partners, please contact us. I think mm -hmm. Rama will post the contact um, yeah. and, and, and even our phone contact, uh, and then we can strengthen uh, partnerships, uh, which is multi-stakeholder uh, in that context. And so we are working with the government of the day at all levels, federal, state, local, especially district level uh, at the grassroots. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Danison. I guess that is all the time that we have today.
Thank you so much uh, to Dr. Danison. Thank you so much to Professor Dato Dr. Rashila Ramli. And also thank you so much to Saudari Nur Rahma Osman. I uh, wish you all the best. Uh, more so with the new budget is coming and uh, hope things are going to go uh, even better from the years before. Uh, that's all. Thank you so much. See you in thank the next you. session. Yeah. Thank, thank, you. Okay. thank you. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you. Very good thank moderation. You, yeah. Thank you thank to you, the others also. in the panel. Yes, thank, thank you. you. All right, thank you. Thank you, viewers. Uh, that's all for the session today uh, with our uh, respected panelists. Uh, from the organizer, I would like to apologize for any uh, shortcomings. Thank you so much. Have a good lunch. See you. Assalamualaikum. Selamat uh, tengah hari. So, okay. See you. Bye bye.